It's over 50 years since they broke up, but it seems the Beatles still have a hold on the culture. A few days ago, the new epic Get Back was released. It's an eight-hour fly-on-the-wall documentary made by Lord of the Rings director Peter Jackson. It tells the story of how the Beatles made one of their last albums, Let It Be, and the build-up to their famous last live concert on the roof of the studio. As expected, there's been wall-to-wall -wall coverage of it in the media, so we thought, how can we do something different on Rebel Wisdom? So we asked Eric Davis, probably the premier historian of the counterculture, and Anderson Todd of the Wisdom and Consciousness Lab at Toronto University, and a huge Beatles fan, to riff on the psycho-spiritual legacy of the Beatles. And they didn't disappoint. And so you have this kind of raw eros that's, that's sort of sublimated into pop worship, which we also saw with film stars, but not in the same erotic proto dionysian way. So then we come to this thing, what happens in the 60s? So yeah, the Beatles start out with that kind of invocation with an Elvis style, mostly female, exuberant, Bacchic extravaganza. But like magicians, you know, Aleister Crowley's on the cover of Sgt. Pepper's, they take that energy and rather than just push it into a further Dionysian element, the way that, say, the Doors did, very Dionysian figure, but he crashes and burns, alcoholic burn, you know, but the Beatles, they just take that energy and they sublimate and transform it into a iridescent, multidimensional meditation on consciousness and media and the history of popular music, not just rock and roll, but, you know, dance, you know, older times, old timey music, silly British music. It's just extraordinary what they do. But I think you can see it as a kind of semi partly intentional and partly situational magical operation where they transform those Dionysian energies into something greater. They seemed to sort of sniff out the zeitgeist of the of the 60s, you know, and in each of its sort of progressive steps. And as they sort of embodied and amplified that, you know, the sense of time um, you had mentioned when we spoke earlier, David, this idea that they were sort of avatars in a sense of the 60s. And I think that this idea that they were um, very much kind of riding a cultural wave, but simultaneously uh, embodying it in some important way for people, um, really lifted them out of the status of being sort of pop icons and very rapidly pulled them into the sort of territory that's normally reserved, frankly, for sort of religious movements. Um, so it's not surprising to me in a way that they are uh, still quite relevant because I think that they, in a sense, mark the first major sort of cultural thing to occur after World War II and the change of sort of the cultural order. And that wave is still very much carrying. To join events like this, check out Becoming a Rebel Wisdom member and hope you enjoy the conversation. Let's maybe just start with this particular, um, you, you both watched the whole thing. Let's start with maybe what is different about this or whether there are any kind of realizations or thoughts or reframings of the Beatles in light of this new series. And then we'll go a bit deeper into kind of the, the Beatles hold and the Beatles influence on the culture. Um, Eric, what did you make of this series itself? Did you, did you learn anything from it? Was there a new framing on the Beatles? Yeah, you know, I guess I would approach it a little bit differently. And I, I first, I just got to say what a wonderful opportunity it was to watch all those hours. You know, I, I, I realized that some people find it um, a bit tedious uh, but A, that tedium is part of what the studio experience is like. Anybody who's been in a studio realizes that tedium is part of the part of the picture. And it's really the only way to allow something like a, a, a rich, multidimensional engagement with their creative process, which doesn't just mean their particular songwriting, but the way in which the whole state, the whole arena is constructed. And I thought that the that one of the funny thoughts I had about this, the, the, the film is how experimental it is, not intentionally, not like Peter Jackson's going, oh, I want to make an experimental movie, but just because of decisions made about editing, about sound editing, about what stays in, about letting it be really long, um, is that it ends up, you're, you have like, you're going to have like millions of people around the world are going to be sitting watching essentially non-narrative, weirdly edited cinema where like voices are coming through and it's sort of like 
Nashville or the acid test recordings where everybody's talking over each other and it's sort of surreal and you can't really understand what's going on. And then it's like happy and then it's depressing. And it's actually a very interesting document. So I feel like it's not so much that I reframed the Beatles in any way, but I did feel more uh, intimate with their psychologies in some sense. And also uh, very aware of dynamics in the creative process that I had read about before, but it, it took on a different meaning being able to actually see it happen slowly, piecemeal, piecemeal with, with, with challenges and, uh, and, and conflicts as part of it, but not as some kind of major narrative. I guess that's the final thing I would say is that we just watched the trailer and the trailer is trying to make a narrative out of it. Oh, it's the show. We're going to do the show. They have two weeks to write a, to do a whole thing. Da, da, da. But when you actually watch it, a lot of it is non-narrative. And that introduces you to a dimension of the story that's sort of outside the frame or at least unframed in an interesting way that makes it more valuable than I would have expected. Yeah, Anderson, what did you make of it? I thought it was delightful. I, uh, um, you know, I had read some of the sort of advanced uh, reviews of it, and there were a few that were like, unless you are absolutely diehard, you do not want to, you know, bang through eight hours of this. Um, so I, I guess I find myself happily on the diehard side. I wasn't bored uh, at all. And I sort of have my fingers vaguely crossed for Peter Jackson to release the, uh, you know, 18 hour uh, rough cut version or something. Um, yeah, I mean, Certainly the non-narrative aspects of the of the film are really interesting. There's this very fly on the wall quality. And that applies both for sort of watching uh, things like, um, you know, Paul McCartney sort of spin straw into gold in this like noodling of notes from which suddenly emerges something recognizable. I mean, it's sort of pure magic. Um, yeah, I don't know if it sort of overturned any of my ideas about the sort of story around the, the Beatles breakup, although it, it deliberately makes a point of de-emphasizing Yoko's role in places. Um, but, uh, but there were definitely some things that we had access to, some conversations between uh, the specific band members that really cast their sort of interpersonal dynamics and their creative dynamics into a completely um, different light. And um, some of that stuff was just remarkably striking and quite, quite touching. Um, it's humanizing uh, in, in a number of ways. You know, John, who's often sort of an aloof figure, uh, ends up with a really uh, humanized and sort of emotionally introspective tone in a number of places that's, um, you know, not always focused on. So it felt to me like it sort of brought brought a degree of, of fine-tuned clarity to places rather than sort of, you know, flipping the script or anything. I have a question for Anderson just off the bat because I know he's a little bit more more of an expert. I'm not a Beto file in terms of you saw my record, my, my book collection and stuff. You'd recognize that I was not hardcore. I know the hardcore. I have great appreciation. And I'm not claiming to be one. However, so I have a question, though. You mentioned the Yoko Ono presentation. And one of my reactions to this was going, well, my my impression is that Yoko comported herself extremely well. I thought she was present, but. Uh, un unobtrusive, not being obnoxious. And, and I had this sort of image in my head of her being sort of this shrill, demanding person. And she seemed actually pretty cool. And when they were jamming and doing freak out music, it was totally awesome. And I was like, yeah, she comported herself very well. And I really admired like Paul's little riff about, hey, you know, so what? So they're, they're together, they're in love, who cares? And so what I'm curious though, is whether you feel that that was, uh, very much a, de a, de a decision about the editing and the portrayal uh, that there were things that were that she was more active in some of the dissension around of that at this period of time than we really got a sense from from this. So I'm just kind of curious, just informationally. Yeah, I mean, there are a few sort of trails of breadcrumbs without going too deep into spoilers around the, the actual film, which I do recommend people watch. But um, there are a few sort of trails of breadcrumbs on the degree to which um, she was somewhat intrusive. So, you know, Paul spends some time saying like, you know what, of course they're in love, you know, he wants her here, et cetera, et cetera. But Paul, of course, is doing his level best at this point to, uh, to keep them from flying apart. Um, and so, you know, this peacemaker quality, I think, uh, really comes up through that. On the other hand, you know, they talk about this meeting that they had with George, and although we don't see this or hear it because it's happening at his house, you know, we find out it didn't go well. And when we do hear them talking again, they're like, well, it seems like Yoko was speaking for John. So 
um, you know, I didn't feel like she was sort of loud and shrill or demanding on camera. And I don't know how much of that is Peter Jackson's editorial choices. Well, that's not true. She was definitely shrill, uh, which is to say that she spent a lot of time <laughs> shrieking into a microphone. Um, but uh, um, I don't know how much of that is Peter Jackson's, but there was a sense of, you know, here's the four of them sitting in a circle trying to sort of work magic. Uh, and she is a, a constant presence. And one wonders how much that was sort of disruptive of, you know, sort of closing the circle. On the other hand, uh, apparently George had a couple of Hare Krishnas wandering around the perimeter of the, the Twickenham uh, the whole time. So, you know, maybe it wasn't as disruptive as one might initially think. So I'll just put the Q&A sheet into the chat. So if any questions come up, do add them to the Q&A form. Um, I guess the a good place to start is why is this still relevant? I, it was fascinating. Like there's a couple of things that came up as I was doing the research for this. One of which is it's now longer since the get back sessions. They were in 1969 between now and then than it was between then and the end of the first world war. So it's over 50, which is an astonishing thing if you kind of think about it. And yet there's something very modern about them. What is it about the Beatles in particular that still grabs us so many years on? Anderson, do you want to go first? Sure. Yeah, I can jump in. So, I mean, I think it's an intersection of a, of a few things. You know, um, one is, of course, that they were um, tr tremendously creatively and technically innovative. So, you know, even where they didn't necessarily sort of originate a technique, you know, they were borrowing it from perhaps earlier musical traditions or people had, you know, um, done certain things technically, like the degree of technical innovations, which they brought into music and pushed the edges of the technology really opened up um, a field uh, and the sort of breadth of places that they cribbed styles from and then fluidly meshed those things together really, I I'm not sure that it's, we've seen the like since. I mean, you know, we had, you know, an opportunity in the Beatles to sort of see the creative production over almost a decade of a group of individuals who individually probably were among the best songwriters uh, who have come along in a few centuries. So to watch them creatively, it's, you know, it's bound to make a mark. But the other aspect of it, I think, is a question somewhat of cultural timing, you know, uh, partly by dint of their sort of role as cultural amplifiers for certain sorts of trends and things, but also because they had a, a nose for stuff, they seemed to sort of sniff out the zeitgeist of the, of the 60s, you know, and in each of its sort of progressive steps. And as they sort of embodied and amplified that, you know, the sense of time um, you had mentioned when we spoke earlier, David, this idea that they were sort of avatars in a sense of the 60s. And I think that this idea that they were um, very much kind of riding a cultural wave, but simultaneously uh, embodying it in some important way for people, um, really lifted them out of the status of being sort of pop icons and very rapidly pulled them into the sort of territory that's normally reserved, frankly, for sort of religious movements. Um, and there was a, you know, a field and a charge around them that there were earlier versions of. I mean, people went nuts for Frank Sinatra and Elvis Presley. But here we had you know, four individuals that catalyzed this kind of like Dionysian current right, uh, that had people shrieking. And Beatlemania as a phenomenon, of course, you know, some of it's demographic, you have the, uh, the baby boomers and so on, but some of it is just, you know, this enormous current of sort of, you know, the energy of progress and the sense that things were changing and they managed to sort of emulate, tap, reflect, and to some extent steer that. Um, so it's not surprising to me in a way that they are uh, still quite relevant because I think that they, in a sense, mark the first major sort of cultural thing to occur after World War II and the change of sort of the cultural order. And that wave is still very much carrying. Yeah, I, I agree that we're, we're still in some ways riding the wave that that's, that 60s moment is about, not just in terms of counterculture or popular music, but really media. And one of the ways that I've come to think about it, and I've been thinking about this a lot lately, lately because I've done a lot of work on the 70s. I'm fascinated by the 70s. I'm fascinated by the idea that something happens there. And what we're seeing here, of course, very interestingly with the Beatles is that they end in this 1970. So it's like they're, they're like this, 
movement that goes into that moment and then they crack at that transfer point and then they go on and they they have very 70s careers uh you know they do very they do the 70s in a very rich way the way they did the 60s together and so what what why am i interested in this period and i realize one of the reasons is that we are so deeply into the digital now that we can turn around and we can see the analog in its entirety in a really interesting way. And the analog world, analog media, analog culture, in a way is it, it kind of prophesies a lot of things that we're going through now, while also featuring a lot of differences, some of which are, are worthy of, of a great deal of respect and even nostalgic longing in the sense that there was a space to be as huge and resonant and multidimensional and magical as the Beatles were able to do in that period of time that there is no space now for anything like that, however huge you are. And so there's a way of like looking back at that moment. And one of the things I loved about this documentary, and I do also really encourage people to see it, even if you're just sort of a casual fan, because there's something very special about these people and this music and what was happening. And one of the things that I noted that you can tell in the music as well, and knowing about their, you know, their biographies, but it's very evident, is how deeply immersed they are in the circulations of media. They're reading the articles about themselves. They sing their own songs the way they sing Chuck Berry songs, as if they are already part of the canon from which they are drawing. They're, they're, they're playing with references all the time. They're, they're praising other, oh, did you, did you see Good, Bad, and the Ugly? You know, it's like they're, they're saturated with analog media. And part of what allows them to have that enchantment, and I want to tie it into something um, Anderson said that I think is really key. So you look at those earlier pop phenomena around Frank Sinatra, particularly around Elvis. What's actually happening? One way of looking at it is that Elvis frees the hips. Elvis is a, is a pop star in the visual framework on the, on the television screen whose hips move. And those hips invoke Black culture, they evoke sexuality, they evoke a lot. And that it's just like a trigger. It's like Pavlov's bell. And suddenly people respond. And so you have this kind of raw eros that's, that's sort of sublimated into pop worship, which we also saw with film stars, but not in the same erotic proto dionysian way. So then we come to this thing, what happens in the 60s? So yeah, the Beatles start out with that kind of invocation with an Elvis style, mostly female, exuberant, bacchic extravaganza. But like magicians, you know, Aleister Crowley's on the cover of Sgt. Pepper's, they take that energy and rather than just push it into a further Dionysian element, the way that say the Doors did, very Dionysian figure, but he crashes and burns, alcoholic burn. You know, it's just, it's dark, it's heavy. Blah, blah, blah. And in fact, in some ways it's even, it never really delivers on some of the, the Dionysian energies that it started out with. But the Beatles, they just take that energy and they sublimate and transform it into a iridescent multidimensional meditation on consciousness and media and the history of popular music, not just rock and roll, but you know, dan you know, older times, old timey music, silly British music. It's just extraordinary what they do. But I think you can see it as a kind of semi, partly intentional and partly situational magical operation where they transform those Dionysian energies into something greater. And then one final note that that, that relates to this is that is the drugs. So you have, so again, think about the history of media. Post-war the development of cybernetics, we start having television, television starts to go color, we have offset printing, more and more cheap color images, we have the development of sound technology in the, in the mid 60s is doing multi-track recording. They start to do multi-track separated recording where you're no longer all the bands singing in one room, blah, 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 blah. So all these things are happening. And then people start taking drugs and particularly psychedelics. And the psychedelics has this interiority to it, this, this visual phenomenological uh, experiential dimension that gets translated or mimicked or ported into this emerging media environment. And the Beatles, 
even though they don't make psychedelic music the way that other bands we could talk about do, in some ways they make even more psychedelic music because it's more multidimensional and more mind manifesting. And so what you're hearing, and part of the reason it works for us now is that in the late 60s, not just with the Beatles, but they're very exemplary, a kind of psychedelic inner world was carved out within popular culture that has never gone away. It's just transformed and we're still riding it. I put on my Oculus in a way, totally not a 60s technology. And yet the world I'm entering is in some ways that interior technological media, phantasmagoric space that was carved out in the 60s and particularly by these guys in a lot of ways because of all of the elements that they were able, that they were able to invite into that world, Indian spirituality, you know, a, da, a kind of Dada spirit of surrealist nonsense, uh, you know, profound emotions, Black American music. I mean, it's really quite, quite extraordinary. Uh, so that, that's a lot of why I think it still resonates. Yeah, I, I'd love, uh, Anderson, I'm sure there was so much that, that you'd love to kind of spark off. So the, the less that I'm involved, the better. I think there's a, there's a great conversation here. Yeah, I think you 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 just carved the space out quite well right there. Uh, there's a, there's enormous breadth and scope to what they do. I mean, they're reaching very far back into the past, often into the the classical and earlier music traditions. But even you know, we get that tiny clip in the trailer of them saying, you know, it, you know, uh, in the future everybody's going to be like they broke up because Yoko sat on an amp. But the line that they I don't I think they cut it, but anyway, is fifty years from now he says. So there is this, there is this sense right there in that conversation they have of like that people will be talking about them in 50 years, this kind of embeddedness in, uh, in the, the full sort of scope of time. And then also the, the opening of scale, you were talking about the drugs and it's, it's interesting. I was kind of running through their sequence of drugs of choice, uh, over their career as the Beatles and thinking about the, um, kind of specific psychoactive effects, the cognitive effects that each of these things have is an area of work for me. So, you know, they start out with sort of journeyman tobacco and alcohol, right? Classic British working class um, alcohol and, and tobacco. So, you know, classic sort of um, beer hall stuff. Um, but then in Germany, of course, they discover uh, amphetamines. And here they are playing, you know, eight hours a night in these shows, right? Uh, cementing skills that are gonna serve them for the rest of their careers. But they're also working through this enormous amount of, of amphetamine. And that stuff has a way of creating a kind of um, web work of associations, but also really cementing certain things. Like I sort of suspect that probably has no small role to play in the degree of skill that they managed to nail down in this period of time playing constantly. And then eventually they switch out and they start getting into uh, sort of cannabis, right? And so here we have this like bringing down from the speed years, these long jumps of association, the beginnings of kind of psychedelic, you know, stoner culture that they're keeping under wraps because they don't want the media to know about this stuff, but they're not doing a very good job. Then they make the jump through to LSD. And that is, of course, opening, but only for a little while. They don't, they don't sort of stay with it continuously. They pick it up, they take what they can, and they move on, which is something they do repeatedly. Uh, and then I often think, in fact, of transcendental meditation, their time with the Maharishi also in this kind of context, right? They're doing mind expanding, you know, contact with the mystical, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then, of course, I was thinking about the drugs that they were into by the end, which are, you know, cocaine on Paul's part and heroin for John. Uh, and it, it shows. Um, you know, as two drugs that uh, sort of spark a certain amount of ambition or bring ambition down, you can really see how it's wearing on them. But uh, yeah, in general, just the sheer amount of scope that they kind of carved out in popular imagination, but also public discussion, things that just weren't talked about. They had been kind of around, but they had no uh, no exposure. And so, yeah, it's, a, it's an enduring, uh, you know, kind of legacy that they brought for all of us, this interiority. It's interesting that you mentioned the virtual, the virtual and the analog. I was thinking about that as well. Yeah, um, yeah. No, there's, there's so much to 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 go with here. Uh, what 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 you said, just in terms of uh, reflecting on on drugs, and one thing about speed that's always important to mention because it gets a bad rap for very good reasons. But one of the things about amphetamine is that it's completely demonstrable in an objective way that you do your tasks better. <laughs> 
it actually is a performance enhancer. It's just that it's very deleterious. So it's like, you can't maintain it, but you're actually better. You, you know, on cocaine, you think you're better, but you're not. But your speed, you're actually like, hit, you know, landing that drum break just the way you wanted to. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting process to think about, but also the sort of 70s quality of the, the cocaine thing and how that's kind of breaking it apart. And that, that's, it's, it, that's one of the things that as somebody who's like really interested in these, in these epochs is you can see they're just kind of going through the very process, the inability to maintain a certain hope and expectation about what the 60s would mean, whether it's mediated or immediate, it's whether it's revolutionary or whether it's consciousness, that at some point it, that, that, that vision is impossible to sustain. And then people are like, oh my God, what do we do? Where do we go? And you know, what happens afterwards with George trying, you know, sustaining a, a sort of commitment to, to uh, unusual religious practices from a Western point of view, the, inviting in the, this, these new Asian ways and, and really trying to kind of walk the talk and be a Hare Krishna. And tons of people did that in the 70s to, to follow gurus and yoga and these kinds of practices. And then over here with John, we have this kind of post-religious. He tried, it didn't really work out for him, but he just goes off into primal scream therapy and, you know, intense drug abuse. And I mean, he becomes this sort of, I mean, he's one of the amazing things about him that has to do with with the partly with the junk, but also psychologically. And we see this very much in in the um, their the way that their personalities manifest in the show. And I'd like to you you made some comments earlier about their personalities that I thought were really significant, and I'd like to hear more about that in a second. But one element that you talk about is the kind of there's a kind of passivity and a disorganized quality to John that's really quite remarkable. Uh, I mean, it's very funny and very Dada and very like magical and strange. And yet there is a sort of disorganization operating there that you, especially knowing what is lies ahead and how rough the, the next five years are going to be for him uh, is really quite kind of quite poignant, but it does seem to get back to this avatar thing. And to ask your, the question of you again, that whether it's happenstance or the way that magic works, that they're for, they're, the, the, the personalities that we see in the film of these four men, they, they kind of crystallize certain tendencies and trends and character and reactions to the sort of exploded world that the, the counterculture and new media culture had produced by the end of the 1960s. So I'd love to hear you talk a little bit more about that, the, the personality elements that you see operative in in the film yeah i mean you know so the the beatles as four personalities was you know picked up really early on of course they were all relatively sort of quick and witty and there was a big shift there from you know the the previous sort of ethos of having like a band with a front man with a band behind you didn't know the front man was who you paid attention to here we had you know a foursome specifically um and so that was picked up on you know obviously really early in the in the the films and so on and so forth you get a, a different version of that here and you know, to whatever extent they were avatars, you almost get the sense that, sure, by 1970 and the rest of the culture, everybody, or maybe post-Altamont 69, everybody is going, crap, where is this going? Is it falling apart? Like, what's happening? That obviously hits them quite a bit earlier. Like, having to be torchbearers for this sort of current of energy running through the culture is tremendously taxing. It's not just that they're, you know, they don't want to do live concerts because they've been threatened by the KKK. It's also that, you know, the just just the the pressure the the external regard people watching them the sense of expectations the sense that they are the beatles and that gets reflected in the film in a lot of different ways so paul who traditionally sort of gets painted as being um micromanaging bossy that's how, that's how people shorthand paul instead comes off as being in fact attempting to grasp some kind of discipline to really hold them together and keep them going um uh, after their manager, their daddy, as they say, right? Brian Epstein uh, died 18 months before. Um, and, and there's a deep kind of concern. It's really like he's trying to plug the holes in the ship, but this comes out in a kind of discipline and approach from a guy who very much is at the height of his powers. I mean, just watching him kind of noodle away uh, at a piano and come up with four songs that you've been humming for 50 years is remarkable. Um, you know, John uh, is sort of spontaneous and he's doing this constant shape shifting. He's sort of miming, pantomiming, right? He's doing character work. But when he's not doing that, there's a, a real emptiness 
-hmm. Like he's kind of either on and, and doing stuff or he's not there. Um, kind of tuned out. He's often late and so on and so forth, uh, which is one of the things I was thought, thought was so interesting about some of the more candid conversations, which is that you hear moments of John's sadness really come through. And normally that's completely shielded behind all of this sort of wry performance stuff. Um, George uh, is intensely sort of self-promoting and self-negating or something. He, he, you can really see the ways in which the other band members are sort of treating him like a little brother and pushing him off to one side. Um, but also, you know, he has a great moment where he's sort of talking about the religious impulse and says, you know, look, if we were really being our authentic selves, our authentic selves, we wouldn't be here. None of this would be happening. And so he's sort of lancing right towards this kind of shell of inauthenticity that's around them. And yet simultaneously, he wants to strike out and record on his own, right? Uh, and then Ringo is there. He's just there. He very often looks bored uh, and like he wants to work. He's kind of fed up with the whole thing in some ways. He wants to work, but everybody is bickering or whatever. He's got no material to work with. But there is a lovely moment, I think, where um, uh, Paul's wife, Linda, um, sort of says that she feels comfortable around George that he's, he's comforting, that he's kind. And so there Ringo. are these references. Right, that's right. Um, so, you know, this idea that, that this foursome represents sort of different personalities, I think was one of the breakthrough things that people cottoned onto. I mean, um, it, it's funny, it reminds me a little bit of, you know, in, in various religious traditions and certainly in sort of the Hindu tradition that George was interested in, right? There are lots of different paths up the spiritual mountain. So you can pick, you know, the path of the heart or the path of the mind or the path of, uh, you know, um, uh, the body, et cetera, et cetera. These sort of different paths to ascend. And one of the classic questions, of course, that everybody always got asked, you see it in interviews over and over again, which one's your favorite beetle? This idea that you could somehow find something to resonate in this set that was sort of, you know, a unified foursome, uh, but at the same time, right, represented these very different sorts of tendencies and stuff that nevertheless were operating together is, I think, something that continues kind of straight through. Um, you know, it's almost... Um, and, and I remember thinking this as a kid, right? People would have uh, sort of arguments about this stuff. Um, you know, which, which beetle was the best and which beetle whatever, right? And, um, you know, there's something almost like finding a connection to a particular saint or a particular apostle. Uh, I mean, it, it probably helps that a couple of them have the names of apostles. Uh, and three of them, I guess, have the names of saints. Ringo, not a common religious name. But um, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's remarkable. And watching the personality dynamics. I, I was going to say just quickly, um, I was thinking when you mentioned the sort of digital versus analog thing, that one of the things that was so interesting about this that I didn't realize until after I finished watching it was um, it was sort of a digital innovation that made this all possible. So I didn't realize, but they, of course, so much of this stuff was filmed in mono right? Mono sound. And very often it was the case that you couldn't actually hear what they were saying. In fact, when in the original footage, when John and Paul are having sort of intense conversations, they often crank up their amp and strum idly, basically to drown out the mics so that they can't be recorded because they know they're on film. Uh, but Peter Jackson paid a team of people to do like a machine learning program to basically pull all these separate threads out. So that first you can remix the music so that's actually listenable, but also you can extract these voices. So the conversations are sort of pulled out of this, right, this sort of analog, um, you know, stew. Uh, and uh, so you get these really crisp sections, which just couldn't have existed, basically, five years ago, you couldn't have heard any of it. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I love that the, the fact that it is kind of a deeply, deeply, deeply digital meditation on this analog object. And it has some of the the nostalgia factor that goes on in a lot of digital rela relationships with the past where you can actually mm -hmm. get closer back, but even in your capacity to have get more information from these analog records, there's still this sense of, of, of not being, you know, there's this kind of melancholy in the operation that I feel very, feel very much as part of our nostalgia for, for this moment. And nostalgia is a complicated, or it should be complicated. It's not simple. Like, Oh, I wish I was back there. It's just something about this relationship to things across time. But another element of that digital quality, which is interesting because that's a very sophisticated kind of information extraction mechanism. It's the kind of thing you would associate with, well, let's say uh, police or intelligence forces. And I thought it was very interesting, the quality of surveillance culture that was already part of the film. 
So in some sense, we are participating in a surveillance culture by being able to enjoy uh, the extraction of this data from their attempt to actually hide uh, or to disguise or cloak some of their their comments. But the most obvious example, of course, is when when you know uh, uh, when when Paul and John go to have a conversation about George, and they put a microphone on the table, and they didn't know it was there. And we hear this very intimate conversation, which is quite illuminating because they're speaking in a quite sensitive, mature loving way, which was really wonderful to hear. Like, it's like a relief, you know, and you can kind of also tell that they're not really sure how to make decisions. They don't, they don't really know how to come together and make a decision. That seems too complicated, but they have a lot of feelings for George and for the difficulty of his position. But the fact that we're listening to this thing is very unsettling. And it's unsettling because we we're both participating in a con very contemporary moment of kind of surveillance culture, directed backwards against our, uh, uh, you know, towards our heroes, but also having to recognize that the surveillance was already there. It was already candid camera time. They were already putting that camera inside so they could watch the cops go by when they were trying to bust them. So there's, there's a weird, it, it's like, there's like, we're, we're both, the, the, both the differences and the similarities between our hyper digital moment and this analog explosion in the late sixties are, are kind of highlighted and brought forward, uh, you know, by that element. Um, I wanted to also just throw out another thing is that it's just, just talk a little bit more about music. You know, as a music fan, a music writer, spent a lot of my life listening and thinking about music, playing some. Uh, I find that as I get older, I'm more and more interested in how music is made rather than the finished product, although I like enjoy the finished product. But I'm always more interested in hearing pro producers talk about decisions they're making than in hearing the pop star talk about their their lyrics or something like that. I'm not that interested anymore. And so we get to see a lot of that, which is just extraordinary. But I, but one of the things that I realized that was that there was a shift for me as somebody who as, on that a, a playground as a kid was like, which, which is your Beatle man. And then like, it was totally obvious that it was John for a while. And then at a certain point I started to develop the George kind of sensitivity as I became more interested in spiritual practice and all this kind of thing. And I always, you know, Paul was always a little Northern can, can handle the sentimentality a little bit too pretty, but whatever, you know, wasn't that into it. And watching it this time was kind of interesting in that I, I, I understood something about Paul in a different way, not just as a personality and that quality of striving and that quality of discipline of trying to kind of not be the daddy, but realize that without a daddy, it ain't going to happen. He, he's got some of the position to do that and his thoughtfulness about that. But the other thing I, 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 that came through very strong, and this is like one of those statements that maybe you can't justify critically exactly, but it was just a core, which is like, all these guys are amazing and all three, the, the three songwriters are amazing songwriters. I mean, Ringo wrote his songs too, but they're, they're amazing songwriters, but Paul is a genius. Paul is a musical genius like Frank Zappa, like uh, Brian Wilson, and not like a lot of other people and watching because genius is kind of ahead and beside you. It's like, you can't really control it. And so what, just watching that process was was really interesting. And then the other comment to make about the music, you were talking about the way of how heterogeneous they are. You know, they're taking all these different styles and bringing it together and very much styles that aren't just associated with the counterculture, which is part of what makes them so magical. And in any Rolling Stones, Beatles of showdown, which is part, which is associated with, it's, it's, it's the next conversation you have uh, on the, on, you know, on the playground. It's like, which of the two, you know, which are you a Stones guy or a Beatles guy? And I love the Rolling Stones. I probably listen to the Rolling Stones more than I listen to the Beatles, but I'm always going to be a Beatles guy because it's so multidimensional. It's like the whole history of music is in there, you know, and and but what I really love about this late period that I again, I could I got I could recognize in a way that the recordings themselves hadn't quite alerted, although if I was paying more attention, I might have, is that as they go through and they digest and reconfigure all of these different forms, including psychedelia and folk and pop music and Dylan and all this kind of stuff is that. They're, the way in which they turn to sort of back to Black American music at this point 
is just phenomenal. And, and even, even just the kind of synchronicity that Billy Preston ends up getting to be on the record and the way the riffs work and the way they're playing these old rock and roll tunes and these old R&B tunes. And you get this sense of sort of, they've gone through this journey of all these different genres, a lot of white European genres. And it's not like they don't still have those elements, but there's a, there's a predominance of black American music of soul in the deeper sense that animates this and Abbey Road that I didn't quite get before for some reason that this, that this documentary allowed me to, to, to sort of recognize or appreciate that on a, on a different level. So anyway, I just wanted to like, because it's so easy to talk about them as icons it's just to remember that the, you know, that the music is extraordinary and always changing. And this is just a remarkable document of how music gets made by really great musicians. Yeah, there's, we'll come to the Q&A in about 15 minutes. There's one question. It feels like you kind of answered it, but I think Adam Curtis said that it showed a culture that was stuck, that we're still, we're still kind of in this um, still obsessed by the Beatles, still kind of in their world. Do you agree with that? I, I got the sense you were sort of saying, no, they, they kind of develop the cultural grammar that we're in. But is there a sense that we're stuck in some way or would you not agree with that? Uh, from on my side, and I want to hear what Anderson has to say, is that I do believe that it's fair to accuse our, our culture really for the last couple of decades of suffering from what Simon Reynolds called retromania and that retromania, however exuberant, however uh, filled with love and passion, with awesomeness, like it's so great. I get to go into a record store and I can buy reissues of obscure records from the 1970s. And it's I love it. I listen to a lot of music from the 1970s. I am a total example of it, that it's fair to see that as a sign of stuckness of uh, being of, of decadence in a certain sense, in a kind of like historical sense uh, of a, a loss. However, the difference is, is that I, I think we need to remember the media condition that we're in, in that retromania is partly an, an inevitable symptom of the way in which we organize, distribute, consume, and, and represent culture. Uh, and so it's it's not like it's all our fault, like, oh, man, if we just had better ideas, we'd be just as fresh as they were in the 60s. It's like, again, there isn't the space for that. So tremendous novelty and innovation can happen, but there is not the space for it to mean the way that it meant then. And analog is just we're more we're analog creatures in a lot of ways. We just work better with it. We're just trying to figure out this digital thing. And it's not clear that it helps culture more than it mutates it in ways that are difficult to really assimilate. And I think we're kind of in that race. And so part of the function of nostalgia, again, isn't just a sign of weakness or lameness or whatever. It's, it's actually an attempt to keep, <laughs> you know, keep ourselves a little sane as we also kind of plunge into this you know, uh, uh, in, in, insane future in a, in a lot of ways. So I, I, I think that's an accurate statement. It's, I think it's a deeper problem than, than we might acknowledge that it really gets down to some really basic situations about where we, where we are and what does it mean to be a young musician? What does it mean to be growing up with this sort of ahistorical quality? How do people represent themselves in the media space? Um, how do they get circulations with fans going and that kind of passionate devotion and fixation uh, that earlier generations of fans were more able to do. And we're just like changing our moods and minds all the, all the time. So I think it's true, but we got to give ourselves a, a break because it's a weird time. But Anderson, I want to hear what you, what do you have to say about that? I mean, it's sort of, it's hard to weigh in on in a way, like there is a self devouring circularity to culture and yeah, some of that, of course, is, is our responses to it. And some of it is the the decisions made by, you know, uh, media conglomerates, right? Because they're playing money ball. And, you know, the when you work it out on a spreadsheet, you can make $1 more uh, making Transformers 7 than 
uh, risking anything on something new, right? So this kind of endless, uh, you know, recirculation is just, it's just money ball. They can sort of do this. On the other hand, um, on the other hand, nostalgia is a sophisticated emotion. There's a reason children don't experience nostalgia. And, you know, it takes, takes time for us to develop the kind of, you know, like emotional sophistication to get that slightly bittersweet quality looking towards the past and to be able to differentiate at some level between like, you know, wholesome nostalgia and rancid nostalgia. And there, there is a difference between these things, you know? Um, you know, by some measures, you know, 1967 was the material peak of our civilization. And after that, in some ways, right, like, you know, we shelve the Concord, we stop going to the moon, we, you know, there are a bunch of things that begin to shrink. And I think maybe this, the end of the 60s also perhaps marks the point in time where the sort of accelerating pace of future shock starts to get to the point where it stops being fun for a lot of people and begins to just be this like continuously accelerating weirding that they can't handle, right, in a certain way. So, you know, to look back at it as a certain kind of high point, I think, is not is not totally unreasonable. You know, the other thing is, and we were talking about this a little bit in advance, but, you know, I'm, I'm reminded here of Hunter Thompson's line in uh, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. So he talks about the energy of the 60s, right, that there was this upswelling of energy that felt that, you know, it was like youth and, and goodness and right were going to prevail simply by dint of their energy, a real sense of momentum. And he says, you know, if you stand, uh, you know, on the right hill and look look out, you can see the place where that wave broke and rolled back into the sea, right? So, in a way, this is a document of just sort of maybe the turning towards autumn of that period. And of course, there's a desire to want to recapture that energy. Now, one hopes, of course, that these things are semi cyclical and, so, and, you know, a large upcoming youth generation with a lot of uh, fire is going to sort of, you know, tap into their own thing. It can't be identical to this because of all of the particularities, because of the time period, because of the demographics, because of the post-war era, because of the cultural movements, because um, the limits of the technology mm -hmm. provide a creative structure in the way that like the limits of a poetic form provide a creative structure. So when you invent back masking and you're working with eight tracks and stuff, like you can be innovative in a way that you cannot in a space of infinite, you know, oral possibilities, which is what we have now, you know, like structure and limitation introduce certain creative things, but are there new limitations, new structures, new things that, you know, are maybe what, 30 years into the future, let's say. Uh, that are, you know, likely to catalyze a comparable, a current that rhymes without sort of being the same thing? I would tend to say so, but of course it makes sense for, um, to look back to this period as like, you know, the four crowned kings of a certain period of time that was in many ways a kind of high watermark for hope and transformation and expansion and growth and, and all of those things. Yeah. You know, I wanted to pull out another another element that I think is really key and good good for us these days to tune into. Very good, very needed, which is humor. And these guys were always notoriously funny and silly, and they clearly managed the stresses of the extraordinary stress, which Anderson has talked about, just being the kind of figures they were, getting this kind of attention. They only had each other, and and you know, there's obviously all sorts of complicated dynamics and being in a band and the humor function both as a way to uh, dodge the demands of the outside and as a way to lubricate the love and friendship that they maintained for a long time and that is still very evident even as they're having these very uh, difficult transitional experiences and the humor is is really I think key to turn into because we don't we don't reflect on humor that much. And a lot of the humor we, that, that marks our moment now is more like, like the stand-up ar artists who can speak the truth that, that we can't really talk about anymore. And so we, there is a kind of space for humor in our contemporary world. But most individuals, I believe, are living in a more and more humorless experience. Social, me social media is profoundly humorless. And I think it's actually part of what is is stressful for a, for a lot of us. And so looking back at them and going, yeah, they're under a lot of stress. They're under a lot of pressure, but the humor is genuine. And it's a certain, especially 
John's humor, where it's this kind of surreal, dry nonsense that is nonetheless, it's not nihilistic. It's not just jabberwocky. There's something kind of um, playful and uh, multivocal about it. It's like you mentioned that he's, he's, he's a mimic. So he's constantly like kind of, it's like he's channeling other voices. And you, again, you get that sense of, of mediation. Um, you know, earlier you had mentioned that whole, you can see our contemporary moment as being excessively over-mediated. But they're pretty mediated back then, too. That's kind of what's interesting about it. That's kind of what resonates. It's not like they're like the Rolling Stones being bad boys and playing R&B hard. It's like, no, they're like suffering from too much media as well and trying to kind of keep it afloat, make creative statements and be funny in a way. I love the moment when Peter Sellers shows up because it's like there could be no better <laughs> avatar for the kind of humor that they're talking about, this sort of wry ability to, it's like an existential, wry, nonsensical quality that's very British, but also very, uh, you know, uh, resonant. Like it's something we can really tune into and appreciate. And I came away from that recognizing how, you know, just I find the contemporary moment, again, sort of humorless and that we're all sort of being sucked into this kind of, you know, understandable sense of, of doom and stress and anxiety. And yet we have to remember that humor is always there. Humor was in the trenches of World War I, some of the most miserable places that have ever occurred in the entire history of humanity that is looming and lurking behind the experience of these, these men in their childhoods and what people suffered and you know, World War II too. But there's something particularly nasty about the World War I trench and the humor was there. So there's something really hopeful and salvific about humor, even though it doesn't really do anything a lot of the time, uh, that I really like came away from this going like, I really hope this is like a spell for, for more humor <laughs> in our moment. Yeah, um, I wanted to pick up just on that. The, I've always had this sense that Monty Python, because they started about the same time as the Beatles kind of collapsed, they, for me, they took on part of that zeitgeist. And then you had this weird kind of link between George Harrison then kind of funding some of their films and turning up in some of their films. And there was this sort of sense of they, they took the torch of that kind of weird British creativity from the Beatles and took it on into, into comedy from kind of music into comedy. No, that makes a lot. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, and it's, it's so appropriate for our moment because it, it, it can take it can take the surreal. You know, it can it can, uh, you know. I saw the photograph. I had to laugh. You know, it's it's uh, there, there's something there's something powerful in in, in that. Um, there is. They were in in a lot of ways sort of not pioneers of the non sequitur because there's surrealist roots to that stuff, but you know, popularizers of non sequitur in a particular way. But it it really is funny. Actually, I I laughed out loud when I watched Peter Sellers run away in discomfort, um, which was maybe laughing for the wrong reason, but I, I laughed regardless. Um, yeah, I would say that maybe is actually one takeaway of this film that really did change my, my perspective about sort of this time uh, in their work, which was how funny and how playful it all is, how much they're still having fun together, because, it, and there are moments that they are definitely not. It is by times poignant and uh, and sort of heart aching uh, in a number of places. But there are also quite a few places where you can just see there's sort of four young guys screwing around with guitars who have, you know, more, more money than some countries to play with. And like, you know, they're exploring that play space, that humor space, they're sort of mugging and doing bit work with each other just constantly, constantly, constantly. And Lots of laughters and lots of smiles. This is something that in this period, you know, you typically hear about how sort of grindingly dull right. and terrible it was. But in fact, you know, you see, you know, this sort of new framing of things where um, they are having a lot of play. So it's um, it's it's a combination of, of opposites, I would say, straight through. It's interesting, right? You mentioned that, of course, Crowley is on the cover of uh, Sergeant Peppers. Uh, the, another guy that's on the cover of Sergeant Peppers is C.G. Jung, uh, and <clears throat> I'm a neo-Jungian. That's one of the things I teach. So that probably was my introduction to Jung, and I think that in lots of ways, it's sort of an emblematic figure. There's so much going on there in terms of this 
this strange alchemy of oppositions and just the, the beautiful stuff that comes out of it. But yeah, fascinating. So we're going to go into the Q&A portion very shortly. Um, I'm going to invite everyone to go and have a look at the questions and add any initials to them that you particularly like. Um, and before we do, I'm going to try and articulate something that I tried before when I was making my notes to articulate, and I, I didn't manage it. So I'm going to try it now and just see whether Eric or Anderson can help me with this thought. Because it's kind of, it's, it's a barely formed thought, but, it, but I've had, obviously, since watching this, and I, I'm a huge fan of the Beatles, my dad had all the original vinyl, and I used to play that as a child, and I've been kind of a fan of the Beatles ever, ever since. And then watching this, this, you, you saw some of the creative process, some of the kind of like, as you said, almost like they're, they're making these tunes out of thin air. And there's something about, for me, about the Beatles, about this sort of tension between the kind of pure creativity. There's a transcendental quality to their music that is then made real in the particular. And there's a weird relationship between those two. There's something kind of transcendental, but transcendental, but also very particular. But I can't quite articulate or or understand. But there is this kind of, and I remember with the anthology album as well. This sense of like you hit, you heard all of the songs in process, but they ended up. There was a rightness about where they ended up. All of the kind of all of the sort of semi put together versions sounded interesting, but they seem to tap. They seem to have almost perfect grasp of the creative process, and they ended up in a place where they fully manifested the creative potential of the thing that they were doing. Does that make sense? And how would yeah. you articulate that? Yeah, um, this film in particular was a, it was just a remarkable window into this sort of combination of top down and bottom up creative processes. So you get the bottom up unconscious stuff, right? The things that are almost sort of semi random that are flowing through, you know, muse like, and then you have these top down structural sort of concerns and things. And, um, you know, they have no formal training. They're just sort of virtuosos. But even still, you know, you hear them, like I said, kind of noodling around. So there is this spontaneous emergence where it's clear that they're just sort of producing stuff. And there is like a, um, a catchiness that they're looking for. And as soon as they catch that catchiness, it iterates and it iterates and it iterates. And then they all come in and begin to impose this kind of top-down creativity. Oh, this is interesting, but it's corny. Let's switch here. We need a key shift. Like here is a place where we can, right? Where they render this very pure upwelling, this bottom up kind of process with sort of technical sophistication of various kinds. And you can hear that in other places. Anthology is interesting. You know, when I first listened to Anthology, I think the thing that caught me the most was that they wrote Eleanor Rigby after they saw Hitchcock's Psycho. And Eleanor Rigby emerges totally from Psycho. And this never really made sense to me until I just heard the strings track from Eleanor Rigby, which is re, 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 like, right? It's the, it's the shower sequence. Um, so, you know, there you have an instance of like, they've caught something and they've fused together a bunch of emotional tones in this really sophisticated and interesting way. But here in this piece, it's really, it's this, it's this top-down, bottom-up combination of things where they're, they are imposing a kind of aesthetic sense and an ear for this material, et cetera. But also they're able to sort of pick, pick it out of this hubbub that they sort of generate semi-randomly. And that's a remarkable combination of artistic skills. Usually people excel on one side or the other. It's rare to see people excel on both and to get multiple people that excel on both um, you know, obviously you're, you're going to have, uh, really groundbreaking stuff, uh, coming out of it. Um, yeah, the, the sort of rise from the unconscious of the bottom up thing caught me over and there were sequences that I watched multiple times of just people sort of picking at piano keys or guitar strings. And then suddenly there it is. Like, I know that piece. Um, yeah. Eric? Yeah. It was, it was actually really, really a trip because, yeah you know you know the song it's inscribed in your brain you've heard it literally thousands of times and and so you're you're so keyed to seeing what the elements will be and it it's a little hard to tell because you're kind of cart before the horse you can't really tell like maybe they just made an arbitrary decision but because that's the decision you've heard you you hear it as being canonical and platonic and so it, it, and you can't really get out of that loop, which is part of what I also got out of it is the way in which 
creativity requires decisions that are not necessarily entirely clear or like a plus you're like okay we're gonna go with that like even the way they said oh yeah we have enough songs for an album and then it becomes the album those are the songs on that album and that they're all very significant and there's a kind of like there's this aspect of creativity where you're you're just making a cut you make you have to make a cut you have Mm -hmm. to make a decision and Really creative people can do that in a way that isn't just top down, isn't just Martinet, it isn't just genius mm-hmm. even. Uh, and there, and you hear that slop. There's room for that slop, and that comes through. And I want to just make one other element that's related to this. Um, uh, a part uh, you earlier, you had talked to Anderson about the the creativity of certain constraints, and of mm-hmm. course, the major constraint of these sessions is that it's recorded live. Right. And so there's a part where George Martin is like. You know, fellas, you're just you're just running this over and over again. You're never going to get there. We we could edit this together in a second. Like he's very like, look, guys, this is silly. But he at that point is representing a kind of technical solution to a problem, to an aesthetic problem that they are. There's no our aesthetic problem is how to make this music live. And that in a way, it changes their creativity, which is part of what I think makes their that last the late music so great is that they actually have reimposed a, a, a constraint that, that in a way works against the skills that they and George Martin had at being able to piece together these puzzle pieces. So now the puzzle has to be live, which just gives it a, a soulfulness that is extraordinary. Yeah, no, it's one in a whole series of mortifications. Like they seal themselves into a pressure cooker. Let's, let's write an entire album for live performance inside two weeks while we're on camera and we have like in-group conflict. Like they absolutely back themselves uh, yeah. into the corner in an attempt to, um, to kind of catalyze the process. And they acknowledge it. They even say, right? It's like, well, we've really been at our best when our backs are against the wall. That's when we shine. And so it's this sort of effort to strip things down, to make things difficult, to impose constraints, to to push on themselves in various ways, um, uh, really brings something quite special, I think, to it. Absolutely. Yeah, it's the concept of enabling constraints, mm-hmm. I think, um, that definitely works with the creativity. Uh, Max, would you like to ask your question? Hi, guys. Um, it seems like the Beatles had like a profound resonance uh, with the times they were in. Uh, but do you think a band uh, today could have a similar kind of resonance? And what would the, the Beatles of our times, uh, what could it look like? Mm. Eric, did you want to jump in? I, I do have thoughts about this, but... Go ahead, Eric. Yeah. Um, so... It's hard to imagine uh, a band sort of launching up to that kind of level, right? We've sort of we've seen like a jagged graph of band impact over over time. You know, there there are these occasional spikes that are a big deal, but they've gone down and down and down. And the last one that I can think of was maybe like uh, I don't know, Radiohead followed by Coldplay or something like. I mean, it does seem like it's kind of trailing off. It's hard to imagine what an act is. Although I say this from the perspective of sort of North America, I think that there are sort of massive trends of this kind. So, uh, for instance, people if you follow K-pop at all. I'm not a big K-pop guy, but there are some K-pop acts that are, you know, they're, they're enormous on the scale that the Beatles were enormous. In fact, more so, right? If you just want to do it by strict popularity and expression of the of times and so on and so forth, there are some K-pop acts that dwarf, right, the sort of impact of the Beatles. So it's hard to imagine sort of hitting that current again for modern times because it is fractitious, Right, we're we're at a moment where yes, our individual availability to media means that things aren't broadcast anymore. The narrow cast. Everybody has an individual news feed. Everybody has their own streaming playlist. Everybody has right. We don't have the kind of moment where it's possible to get something to everybody media wise, but also there are very limited channels for that. You know, like one. You know, the BBC, ITV. Um, a few major record producers, right? So mass production, mass dissemination was there, but it hadn't yet proliferated. And so it's hard to imagine what could possibly sort of dominate all of the channels and all the particular tastes uh, now. But, um, you know, K-pop are giving them a run for their money. Uh, I'll say that. 
Yeah, I don't have much to much to add to that. I mean, as just as I, you know, just to back up the same idea is that the the media conditions are really remarkably different. Even though we can see ourselves in those media conditions, we, we are a, a, an evolution or a devolution from that kind of moment, and a little bit of both, I think, have happened. Uh, but it's changed so much that there's just at the, my, I always go back to the metaphor of space. There's no sp- there's not enough space for something to resonate to that degree. They might, you might get somebody that has as many numbers that gets super pop in some kind of global way. That I, it seems possible because of the economics of scale, et cetera, et cetera. Although unlikely when you just factor in how, how fractal everything is. But even in that zone, I just don't see, there's not, a, there, it, it's just that the media itself is, is so, was so small, tiny. I mean, the tiny little little gnat at that point compared to what we have now. It's just like we can't really imagine it because they're also huge. Um, and so I, I just I think it's just so so different. It doesn't mean that people can't be creative and be remarkable and whatever. It's just that that it doesn't resonate as far. You know, I think that probably technologies resonate that way. Like we all resonate with the iPhone in a, in a way that, but cultural things that we might consume on the iPhone are so narrow cast that they just don't have space uh, to resonate uh, in that way. Awesome. Great question. Great answers. Uh, Tim, I think your question is next. I'm really looking forward to Eric's answer to this in particular. Yeah, I'm just curious where uh, the Beatles fitted into like the the West Coast countercultural scene, like intersections with like the Beat Generation, like William Burroughs or Allen Ginsberg or like the Merry Pranksters and stuff. That's a great question. You know, I, I was thinking about that because I'm I'm probably going to write about this you know, for my next Burning Shore, which is my 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 Substack, which is purportedly about California, although I kind of just do whatever I want, um, and. I don't have a particular good answer for that in the sense that um, I don't think the Beatles were ever perceived as being sort of honorary Californians by the counterculture out here uh, that, you know, they were so distant and it came here so infrequently that it didn't really kind of hook up in quite the same way. At the same time, I think particularly the quality of humor that we're talking about, though it very much is a, a, parti- a particular British style of non sequitur, a kind of dry um, elusiveness, a sort of silliness, that actually that is not dissimilar from a lot of features of prankster, uh, Mary prankster uh, humor in particular. Like I just listened to, there's a recording of one of the acid tests, I believe at the Fillmore West, or maybe it's Winterland, I can't remember, but in San Francisco, and it's super wacky. And it's it's very much like watching the show. There's like a lot of voices over each other. There's this kind of dry announcer voice, like the one that John uses a lot. Oh, well, you know, and he's like faking the announcer, or faking the bullhorn. So I, I think that the, the pranksters in particular recognized sort of a humorous, self-referential, ironic, goofy, silly potential in media, and it, of course, we have to remember that the pranksters were also pushing technology in the the, the acid test. They, you know, they had everything was wired for sound, and there were you know projectors over here, and you talk in this microphone, and would go through that synthesizer over there, and they were also sort of technically constructing this kind of ecstatic simulacrum, not unlike what the Beals did in a more constrained way with these recordings. But there's something about that humor, I think, that is most relevant. A sort of secular side of psychedelia like it's not about god it's not about unity consciousness it's about the sort of inherent silliness and irony and playfulness within our sort of bizarre mutant uh mediated uh, situation so i think those are the that would be the connection i would draw uh the most organically of course there's a famous prankster event at a beatles show so that there is a little bit of connection there yeah, they're they're interesting insofar as they do seem. I mean, this is still a period where the Atlantic Ocean matters for culture, and so there's a sense in which you can really see them as being like two sort of flowers growing off the same beat 
you know, base material in some sense, right? So, so beat poetry was extremely influential on John early on. There was sort of beat performance and so on and so forth. Even in fact, when they when they start getting into stimulants, when they start abusing kind of different kinds of speed, uh, they end up using the same trick as Jack Kerouac, which is mm -hmm. that they cracked open benzedrine inhalers, took the strip out, and dipped it into things, typically coffee. And that was how Kerouac wrote <clears throat> On the Road for three solid days on one continuous scroll. But it was also how these guys played eight hours a night in Hamburg, right? Uh, in front of sort of crowds of, you know, uh, gangsters often. Um, so, you know, a, a lot of the, those sort of cultural movements, that irreverence, right? That sort of being able to take the piss out of self-serious culture, um, when it starts to verge up into the psychedelic, right? And that, that sort of moves further away. It's almost sort of taking the piss out of our conceptions of reality itself. It, the things are almost like twin flowering. So they definitely cross pollinate. There's lots of people sort of crossing back and forth between them, but they're, it's slightly different. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. although there's definitely early impact straight straight down the West Coast, right? The second the Beatles break, everybody sort of recognizes it's like oh, the whole game just changed. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Tim, for your question. And Brian, I think you're you're up. All right. It's time for the question. You guys knew this is coming, I think. Um, who is your favorite Beatle and why? <laughs> you have to answer. <laughs> Eric, do you want to go first? <laughs> um, you know, I had I did I did uh, I did think this was gonna was coming and I, I had my I have my dodge all prepared. Um the thought that I, this is not a very interesting answer because it is sort of a dodge. I can't I can't play the the playground game. I've just thought about it too much, and I, I the way that I think about things is so multidimensional. It's really really hard for me. But I did in watching the film go, who would you actually want to hang out with? Like who would you actually really want to hang out with? And I'd want to hang out with Ringo. I just want to hang to just. Just, it just seems kind of fun. And, and I was funny because like, well, but the, the richness and the complexity and you get to meet that. Da, da, da. I'm like, yeah, but I kind of I kind of see um, Linda's point. Like there was just sort of like, yeah, that get like that, you, that youthful uh, go with the flow, kind of annoyed, kind of funny. Like it was like one of the best fart jokes I'd ever seen in all human recorded history was in that film the Ringo's fart <laughs> joke is is just amazing so in a way it's a kind of disappointing answer it's a bit of a dodge I admit but uh but I actually had that I mean I was just on an emotional level I was like yeah I'd really like to just hang out and drink a beer with Ringo <laughs> yeah it's true Ringo comes off as a real sweetheart in the film and you already had that sense kind of but like you really get to see it you when you see him although actually quite a few of them interacting with kids um, you get a real sweetness to them. So uh, I'll just come out and say, it. I'm a John guy. Uh, I was a John guy growing up from a family of John people. My father was like a diehard uh, John fan. Um, uh, and then I also switched over to George. My, <clears throat> my late teens and early 20s were spent uh, in, in George. Uh, but I came back around, despite John's, frankly, numerous flaws as a human being. Um, and there's there's something about the particular combination of, frankly, his deep, his deep, deep wounds and the way that he uses his creativity to address those things, but also just, I don't know, the mobility of his wit and stuff. Um, so yeah, I'm a, I'm a John guy. Ron, did you want to share um, what you've shared in the chat about the Grateful Dead? Sorry, Ron. Oh, uh, which part, David? You, you mentioned in the chat about the 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 inspiration of the dead on or the Beatles on the dead. I think Eric was keen on that. Oh yeah, just I mean, one part was just that at least Jerry Garcia at one point said listening to the Beatles is what made him say, "Hey, let's plug in." Back when they were a jug band, you know, like a lot of bands, I think were influenced in that way. And, and another crossover is you know all those. American funky composers. I never know the name of the genre, but like Charles Ives uh, and those kind of people were an influence in both directions. I know Paul really listened to them a lot and, and Phil Les from the Dead did. And that's kind of a secret connection. And I, I don't know that a lot of people know about that uh, history in the 60s because it's not the rock and roll, it's more symphonic. I don't know if you guys 
are aware of that thread. That yeah, it's interesting how bands. yeah, both of the both of the bands you can talk about in terms of the way they swallowed certain aspects of experimental music or or you know experimental classical music or definitely non-pop, non-rock sounds and that's part of what the musical universe is, is about and there aren't a lot of things that are like that uh so the, in in that sense particularly the kind of atonality and and um just sense of space uh that they're exploring i think it, that's an interesting connection um yeah they're i mean again right the influences are remarkably wide ranging and really remarkably when you sort of listen to it and i think a lot of this in some ways it's um it's almost an aspect of the sort of the lack of formal training and formal constraint they just don't they just don't see the categories and see the rules it's like sure everything everything goes together it's all music it doesn't even matter sort of what you know scale it's in and right that contributes some of the note of sort of innovation and, and weirdness but also it roots them into that that broader tradition and they just any, anything goes anything goes every musical tradition you could imagine they were kind of interested in and willing to learn from uh, and emulate in some way so yeah in really interesting sort of back and forth conversation um, with a bunch of those other genres. Awesome. I'm going to invite our resident professional musician to ask his question. Danny. Oh, that's pushing it. I, I really, really appreciate this, guys. It's been really fun. Um, yeah, I was just thinking like, while watching it, just look, like the relationships between them, you can see them, but not just with the Beatles, with, with the sort of the Glyn Johns and the, you know, uh, and Mal Evans, especially sort of knowing what happened to him and stuff. And, and there's a sort of heartbreaking element to that, watching him at the piano with Paul and um, the sort of specter of Alan Klein and how enthusiastic John is. And you're like, oh, no, you're sort of saying to the TV, no, please. And I just wondered what you, just what you your guys' thoughts are on that, just like the whole sort of gestalt of that, of, of the, that, that sort of, um, the collection of characters and how they play the role and, and how we never really see it in that format. We don't, we didn't get, never actually seen that, those, those sort of periphery people. Yeah. Just wonder what you think about that. Yeah. I had, I had the same reaction to Mal Evans um, watching him and um, yeah, yeah, of course, knowing what happened. I mean, what was it? Four years, four years later, something. Uh, so uh, for anybody who doesn't know, he, had an unfortunate death where <clears throat> he was uh, kind of semi-psychotic from a drug state and was uh, shot to death by the police uh, in L.A., I think, in his home in L.A. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I thought really the sort of supporting cast aspect of it was absolutely fascinating. The relationships with the production people and the various people sort of cycling through, um, some of which was, you know, you couldn't have written more sort of comically as a character had you tried if i the the number of times that it was suggested that they should go to libya to film with you know two thousand uh, arabs with torches i was like dude give it a rest um you know so th there was lots of these sort of little moments that gave you this sense of oh yeah this isn't being recorded in a vacuum um yeah, likewise, I, I had I had very similar reactions. Uh, I sort of changed my opinion around sort of Phil Spector's involvement because he often gets right credited, and it's like, well, how much of an how much of an influence was it? One wonders, right? Mostly you just see him behind glass, but maybe that was a creative decision. So yeah, I thought that was fascinating, and including in fact sort of their loved ones, right? Family, kids, um, sort of being in and through the space and the general participation in in this whole enterprise. Yeah, fascinating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, th this question reminded me of, of I think, uh, one of the key lines in the film, and it comes up at least twice, I think, by Paul both times, is he talks about what, are the, uh, and Anderson referred to it earlier, what do we do basically without the, the daddy figure? You know, so, so Epstein is this daddy figure, and what we're seeing is like, this is what happens when you don't have the daddy figure. And the reason that's important to bring up, one, it's helpful to understand the psychology of what's going on with the band, but it's also on the avatar level, you know, arguably one of the most significant and most difficult aspects of the 60s generation is, is in a way you could say, this is a generation that decided to avoid and ignore the daddy figure. And what results from that is 
tremendous creativity and experimentation and you know delibidinization and all sorts of stuff um uh desublimation de i meant and yet there's a sort of a listlessness there's like who's at the who's at the tiller and it's it gets actually gets really deep because it's act, it's a bit of a psychedelic conundrum too there's sort of a there's kind of an initiatory dimension to LSD in particular that takes the form more or less of nobody's in control, like nobody is in control. And it's like kind of freeing and kind of horrifying. And it's a real generational kind of problem in a way that we see the band in miniature reflect. And again, Paul's kind of trying to do it, you know, and then you have these multiple producers, you know, and, and I, it, it is unfortunate we didn't get to understand or see more of Phil Spector, but then you got George Martin, he's kind of holding it down and go, Jones has got another thing. And it's like, there's no daddy anywhere, but there's a lot of like support structures. And then, and then Alan Klein makes a lot more sense. Then you're like, I mean, the way that John, it's not just so much that John is like, buys his line. It's the way he's talking about it. Like, oh my God, man, he's like, he can talk all night and he knows everything. I mean, it's like, he's like a wizard. You know, when you hear it and it's not just greed, you know, it's not like, oh, there's he's greedy this way and Paul's greedy in that way. And, you know, it's you can understand that that tension economically, for sure, financially, for sure. But there's clearly a psych psychological dimension to it that's very profound. And frankly, it also kind of indicates one of the one of the great failings of the counterculture in a way is that by not figuring out who the new daddy is the daddies that do end up taking over are crass their money their cocaine their power you know they're they're not good daddies so it's like ah, ah oh alan Clint, no that's not no john no oh you know so I think that, but that's a huge problem, huge dynamic, and you can see it in the film. And I think you can also see it in the supporting staff too. Like nobody's really playing that role. Like how does George, even George Barney, he's kind of like, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll throw it out there. I'll give him a little sp support, but he knows by now that it's not his deal. It's, it's really interesting. Like no, but who, who, nobody's capturing the flag in a way, even though they're fighting over it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh... Yeah, you can really see that running through the whole thing, right? Uh, things fall apart. The center does not hold. And, right, ha having the, the death 18 months before um, clearly sort of tore the anchoring heart out of the middle of things. And that cold shadow was cast across the, the whole thing. And you can see it really I mean, in multiple places. It's both Paul pointing at it directly and saying, like, well, we used to have a daddy who sort of, you know, forced a certain degree of discipline on us. And now I have to do that. And I don't want to do that, but like, we need it. Somebody has to do it. And so, right. Uh, you know, I'm going to do it. When George Martin does show up, uh, they actually get some shit done. Right. Uh, but, but he's not there most of the time because it's a live album. What, like, what do they need him for? But you can really see it with other people. Right. I mean, it's, it's after, um, it's after Epstein's death that uh, George Harrison immediately throws himself mm -hmm. into the, the Maharishi and TM. And is like what, one of the earliest comments that he makes after that, right, is, well, it's OK because death isn't really real. And like you see him move in that pursuit. And that's something you see echoes down the line. Uh, John had so much unprocessed grief around this. And it was very clear. And that was one of the big reasons that he got neck deep with heroin. Right. It was a kind of numbing out something that he talked about later. Right. So you can see all of them kind of grappling with this absence that there is sort of no center to the system. And everybody else is likewise in an orbit. Like there are lots of there's laughter, but there's also a lot of nervous glances at each other mm -hmm. as everybody is attempting to figure out like what's what's happening here. And frankly, for most of the film, nobody seems to be quite sure even what they're doing. Right. It's like, what are we doing here? Well, I don't know. Let's talk about it. And so you get this sort of expanding vacuum in the heart of the enterprise. Yeah. So I, I think um, I think Eric's really right. There is something that's reflective about that. It sort of spins with this tremendous amount of cultural sort of centrifugal force, but it has nothing to pull it back in. And this is in some ways where the where the counterculture finds itself too. Right. It, it gets up this tremendous amount of, of momentum and spins out, 
but then it's got nothing to anchor it back in. It's got nothing left to connect to. It's uh, overturned every idol. Yeah. Yeah, this is a really uh, kind of feels like a very natural place to to conclude because the other the other thing that just came up as you both were sharing was that the the trajectory of the Beatles, the sort of I want mean, to call it a tragic arc, but the really fascinating arc to it is that on one level you can hear you can hear individuation happening through their music. Like that's that's the story of individuation as they. Um, John gets more into LSD, um, George gets more into Indian music, like they, they follow the threads of what makes them come alive and that, and the band blossoms as a result. But in that process of individuation, it's ultimately a dissolving force on the, the entity that was the Beatles. And that's sort of the deeper tragedy or the deeper kind of archetype that's being played out through the Beatles. And that's sort of like why it's such a kind of bittersweet thing that they do individuate in the way that destroys the thing that held them together. Would you agree with that? Yeah, that's very well said. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it makes this uh, a great kind of capstone, you know, this, this documentary, once again, I just, I just got to, you know, give my props, took a lot of, a lot of time and energy and money to, to make this thing. And I really admire the insistence on making it long and, and a bit sloppy or, excessive uh experimental um and and gave, gave gave just giving us a lot to to chew on you know in a, in a, i think a healthy way mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. any final thoughts anderson before we close other than to quite strongly recommend it uh, uh as um uh, as indeed we've all done already um uh, you know it was I will say it's an emotional roller coaster. And this is something that I have a, obviously a deep investment in, um, in terms of both the ideas and the music and the feelings and so on. There was a real roller coaster quality to it. Um, but uh, yeah, I will say that the, there was a great courage, I think, in doing it this way. And, um, you know, out of the various things that have come out of the pandemic, uh, <clears throat> most of them are not things that I would have particularly cared for and I could have done without. Uh, but in this particular case, like, I'm I'm so happy that they didn't try to crush this down into two and a half hours. I don't know. I don't know how that possibly could have made any sense. It really needed this kind of room to breathe um, and expand organically. So um, yeah, as, as, as a kind of capsule movement, but maybe also maybe something that is not entirely bygone, you know, insofar as it's mythic, it's the kind of thing that we can reach back and touch. And it seems like there's still a lot of living, energy there right mm. and maybe still some things to learn so yeah yeah so yeah the energy of this conversation has reflected that i i imagine that we probably could go on for another couple of hours with, without without still even scratching the surface of what the beatles meant i want to say thank you so much to anderson and to eric for being part of this conversation and also for the investment of of the eight hours that they, they put in before we got here as well. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank you, guys. This was fantastic. And thank you for the great questions and the contributions from everyone who's been here. And, yeah, let's do it again sometime when they release a, another one of these. <laughs> the 18-hour <laughs> version. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thanks a lot. I really, I really enjoyed this. Yeah, awesome. If everyone would like to unmute themselves, we'll say thank you and goodbye to Anderson and Eric. And See everyone Thank soon. You Thank you. Thanks, guys. So much. Thank you. Thank you. I loved it. Thank I loved you. it. Thank Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thank you for watching all the way to the end. If you'd like to join conversations like this, check out our digital campfire. You get access to a load of member-only films. You can watch live, ask questions, come to our book club, our wisdom gym sessions, and our regular monthly meetups where we share what's going on behind the scenes and you can also connect with other Rebel Wisdom members. What's more, you can also get discounts on our courses like Sensemaking 101. Check out the link below, and we'd love to see you soon.